To begin with, I'd like to deal with three introductory points. The first is the claim that you'll find in some right-wing populist uh, pseudo-Catholic uh, websites claiming that this uh, is an infallible teaching of the church. It's not. The notion that it's an infallible teaching of the church comes from a reply from the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith asking such a question. And that document, which itself obviously is not infallible, re refers to the encyclical Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, which it concedes is also not infallible, but claims that this encyclical bears witness to the constant and universal magisterium of the church in relation to this subject. However, the constant and universal magisterium of the church down through all the ages can only be established by historical theological research. It cannot be established simply by declaiming it to be so. So in my view, and we'll be examining this over the next half hour or so, uh, the non-ordainability of women is not the constant and universal teaching of the bishops of the church all down through the ages. Now, there are three trajectories in discussing this question. One is the one that says, well, Rome has spoken, the uh, question is closed, end of story. Problem, the story is never ended when it comes to theological reflection and doctrine. God has created us with an unrestricted desire to know and understanding and understand. And therefore, our exploration of these deep questions can never be closed. What can be closed on a temporary basis is a legal ruling that says, for the sake of the organization of the people of God at this particular juncture, this is the law, this is the norm, this is the organizational procedure that we will follow. The church has a perfect right to do that. It has a right to do it because it's necessary to do it. However, it's important not to confuse such a legal ruling uh, with Christian doctrine. Another thing we must look at at the very beginning is the claim that's often made that at the Council of Trent, the church decided all these questions once and for all. Well, the Council of Trent did say that on the Last Supper, by using the words, do this in memory of me, Jesus ordained the 12 apostles. However, can we really look to the details of the Last Supper to answer the question of whether or not women could be presbyters, priests in the church or not? Well, first of all, the Council of Trent never dealt with this question. The question it dealt with was the denial of priesthood by the Protestant reformers. Can we look to the details of the Last Supper to answer the question? I think not. Even though the Last Supper gives us a clear understanding of the central mystery of Christ speaking words of institution over bread and wine against the background of his impending murder and that against his uh, conviction that God the Father would vindicate him, we do not know the details of the Last Supper in sufficient detail to be able to decide whether or not uh, that event either included in or excluded out the possibility of women priests. Why? Because we have the details of the Last Supper in the form of the liturgies of the primitive churches which transmitted it. So we don't have those details. The last aspect of this particular question is the idea that at the Last Supper, Jesus ordained the 12. These were 12 men, and therefore the only people who can be ordained are the 12. However, contextually speaking, the 12, recognize, the 12 represent 
the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. And at the time of Jesus, there were only two and a half tribes. So what Jesus is doing by calling the 12 disciples, he's restoring the unity of the people of Israel and through them the unity of humanity. So it would have made no sense contextually at that time, it would have made no sense for one of those 12 to be a woman. A woman would not have represented uh, one of the sons of Jacob. Nor, may I add, it would have made no sense for one or other of the 12 to have been a Greek or a Roman or a Celt. And just as the successors of the apostles are not, they, they include Romans, Celts, Greeks, Africans, Asians, everybody. Uh, so also, uh, they can include women. If we turn to the New Testament texts themselves, we find many, many women exercising positions of important leadership and ministry in the communities. It seems to me that Paul uh, enumerates about 17 of them. At these, he calls them his fellow workers. He regards them as very important. Hello? Okay. Yes? He regards them as very important. Phoebe, one of them, is a deacon. She's given an important diaconal task, that of actually bringing the letter, the manuscript of the letter of the Romans to the city of Rome. The person she would first meet in Rome is a woman called Priscilla, sometimes called Prisca. She's named six times in the New Testament and in four different books. She's hugely important to Paul in his ministry. She's often mentioned first when she's mentioned together with her husband, indicative perhaps of a priority of ministry in the church itself. If we read the letter to 1 Timothy closely, especially chapters 2 and chapters 3, we'll see that Paul, or the author, is given the instructions about female deacons. He first addresses the male candidates and then the female candidates. He's not addressing wives. A woman that deserves much more importance than often given is Martha, especially in both in Luke's Gospel and in John's Gospel. Martha hosts a Eucharistic assembly. When Jesus is present at that assembly, he's referred to as Lord, a clear indication that this is a post-resurrection narrative in which the Lord Jesus is present. But in addition to being the one who hosts the Eucharistic meal, Martha has a deeper ministry. If you remember that at Caesarea Philippi in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And they give the various answers. And then he says to his, who, to his disciples, and who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is a creedal statement. And in this, Peter illustrates his ministry in the church as the one who confirms his brothers and sisters in the faith by giving them creedal statements of what it is that we believe about Christ. If you look in St. John's Gospel, Martha does exactly the same thing in the meditation on the meaning of the resurrection. You are the Christ, the son of the living God, the one who was to come into the world. In more modern terminology, Martha would be known as a confessor, as in the title Bishop and Confessor. That is to say, someone who articulated the faith of the church in a semi-formal official way. We could go on and on, we'd give many, many examples of this, but perhaps we'd look at it for a moment from the other point of view. In the uh, first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 14, especially in the verses from 33b to 36, we have the notorious text which says that women should be silent in church. And this text has been used all down through the ages, from Origen down to the 
scholastics and in, even in our own time as a kind of a pseudo proof text that women may not speak in church. Problem. That contradicts what Paul says in the letter to the Galatians about there being no more male and female in Christ. And it also contradicts what he says in the very same epistle in chapter 11, when he gives the conditions under which women may pray aloud in church. And his concern in chapter 11 is not whether or not they can speak. He's clear that they can. His, what, his concern is that they do so with decorum. So how do we read these texts? They have been a problem all down through the centuries. There's a sixth century codex called the Codex Fuldensis. And there's a cilium on the side of the text where it gives these, this particular passage, where it instructs the scribe not to read this part in the liturgy. And I would suggest a tiny little exercise, not now, but perhaps later, in twos or threes perhaps, Read chapter 14 of the letter to the uh, Corinthians and notice how the verses from halfway through 33 onto the end of 36, notice the way they jar. They don't fit in with the rest of the text. Then read the text with those verses left out and you'll see that it reads much more smoothly. My understanding of this, when first I wrote about it many years ago, was that this was an interpolation uh, from the sub-apostolic period to make the Pauline text agree with the way the uh, New Testament churches had been patriarchalized following the Augustan um, uh, family law in the empire. Uh, one of the things that makes that clear is Paul's Continue Paul's use there of the word nomos, law. The idea of Paul appealing to the law is most unlikely. He deconstructs law. In modern exegesis, the explanation is somewhat different. And my own study of it suggests it's also more accurate. But what, what we have here is Paul is quoting the Corinthians' own words in their letter to him in order to refute them. And I could give a lot of reasons why I think that. So far from telling women to be silent in church, what Paul is actually doing in this text is he's correcting the Corinthian male leaders for daring to silence women in church. Now, throughout the first millennium, especially the first five or six centuries, but right throughout the first millennium, there is massive epigraphic and textual evidence to the existence of women deacons, women presbyters, and possibly even women bishops. It, it's, it's quite massive uh, and um, it, it would take a, a study in itself, but I, I just note that. But side by side with this massive evidence, there is also evidence of ordination, especially to the diaconate, being banned in the West in four different local synods. So why do they need to ban the ordination of women in four different synods, local ones? Well, the reason is that these rulings were simply considered as laws, enforceable here, unenforceable there, it also means that despite these synods, deacons were, women deacons were being ordained. Continued ambition actually implies continued praxis. From the same period, the end of the fifth century, we have a very interesting intervention by Pope Gelasius. He writes to three Episcopal conferences in the south of Italy, in Calabria, and also in Sicily. He writes them a letter saying to stop ordaining women priests. Well, why would he tell the, the bishops to stop doing it unless they were actually doing it? And then he sends the letters, the same letter, to several other Episcopal conferences. The implication being that the ordination of women priests in the south of Italy in the fifth, late 5th century was not 
and common. But here's the interesting point. In telling the bishops not to do it, he quotes canons, rules, decisions of synods. He never offers an argument from scripture and he never offers an argument from the will of Christ. It's a legal ruling and not a doctrinal one. Several centuries later, there's a very interesting text from a bishop called Atto, A-T-T-O, Bishop of Vercelli in Piedmont. A priest called Ambrose writes to him and asks, what was the meaning of the word presbytera, woman priest, or diaconissa, woman deacon, in the ancient canons? A question many people ask now. His point is, the questioners, in, in, the, in the background, in the questioner's mind is the question, were these simply the wives of priests and deacons, or were they real priests and real deaconesses in their own right? And Atto answers, in the beginning, the harvest was great and the laborers were few, and therefore it was necessary for women also to exercise the ministry of deacon, and the ministry of presbyter, priest. And he quotes Phoebe from Romans 16 as an example. And then he quotes how this was changed later. The word he uses is postmodum, afterwards. He probably means after the Synod of Laodicea in 363. So he's clear that in the beginning there were women deacons and priests. It only changed in the fourth century as a rule as a result of a ruling i find his testimony strikingly relevant to today's discussion he's historically informed he's theologically perceptive and he's canonically observant he knows the rules he keeps the rules but he also knows that things were not always so and that therefore they don't always need to be so So how did it all change? Well, around the 11th century, but from the 10th century up to the 13th century, the manner in which ordination itself was understood went through a major shift. Now, it's important that I make the next point as clearly as I can. The fact that the understanding of some, something develops, that's legitimate. But that does not rule out that the previous understanding was legitimate and valid in its own time and place. Let me give an example. In the first millennium, more or less nobody spoke about the Eucharist in terms of transubstantiation. From the 12th century onwards, they did, and it became a major term in our understanding. Does that mean that because who celebrated the Eucharist in the first millennium didn't know the word transubstantiation, that they didn't truly call down the Holy Spirit of God to transform the bread and wine people were offering? Well, of course it didn't. You can't judge a first millennium praxis in the theological vocabulary of a second millennium development. You can't rule out the ordination of women in the first century simply because the vocabulary to describe ordination in the second millennium is different. But let's look a little bit closer at the way things changed. In the first millennium, ordination wasn't just the moment in which the bishop, by laying hands on the candidate, candidate on the ordinant, ordained him or her. Ordination was a whole process. The process of noticing people's capacity to lead and guide and sanctify the people of God, the process of electing them, the process of installing of consecrating them and of commissioning them. 
ordination was all of that. So you could be ordained a presbyter, you could be ordained a deacon, you could be ordained to different things. They were all considered ordinations. After the 12th century, ordination becomes fixed. Ordination is the power to confect the Holy Eucharist and the power to absolve sins. And everything else is concertinaed, conflated into that. So finally they get to saying uh, that the only ordination is priesthood. What about deacons? Yes, they say deacons are also ordained because that's on the path to the priesthood. That, of course, is historically not true. In the early centuries and right up to the 11th century, the diaconate, being ordained a deacon, didn't mean that you were necessarily going on to be ordained a presbyter. When Ambrose of Milan was elected to be bishop, he was a catechumen. He was never a deacon and he was never even a presbyter. Most of the popes from the 6th to the 10th uh, century, most of them were drawn from the deacons in the city of Rome and were never ordained presbyter. That changed with Hildebrand. He deliberately um, got himself, he was a deacon. And he, when he was appointed, elected as pope, he was a deacon. And he deliberately got himself ordained as a presbyter before being ordained as a bishop. So we could again have a church where you didn't have to be a deacon to be ordained a priest, and you didn't even have to be a priest to be ordained a bishop. Another interesting corollary from all of that was that many theologians, including the greatest theologian of all time, St. Thomas Aquinas, he didn't even believe that the episcopacy, being a bishop, was ordination. Why? Because in the priesthood, he already had the fullness of ordination because he had the power to confect the Holy Eucharist. Therefore, Thomas understood the episcopacy, being consecrated to bishop, as a consecration for an office, not a sacrament of holy orders. That, of course, was um, dismissed and surpassed uh, in the Second Vatican Council. And it's important to point this out for another reason. As we, sh we shall see shortly, St. Thomas had a huge influence on the way we understand who can or cannot be ordained. But it's good to remember that he, he was wrong on, on, on more than one issue. Now, I want to mention two people with a strong limerick connection uh, in this whole debate. One of them was the first bishop of Limerick, Gilbert or Gyulla, as he's called in, in Irish. And several centuries earlier, St. Ita, or St. Ita, who had a monastery at Kilidi in County Limerick. Some background first. In 1018, there's a letter from Benedict VIII, the Pope, to the Bishop of Port Porto in Portugal, giving him and instructing him to ordain bishops, priests, deacons, deaconesses, and subdeacons. So as late as 1018, in papal documents, ordaining deaconesses is clearly still a possibility. Fast forward a little over a century to 1210, and you have Innocent the Thirteen severely criticizing and debarring and forbidding abbesses from blessing their own nuns, hearing their confessions, reading the gospel and preaching publicly. Well, why would he ban them from doing this? Well, because they were doing that. So why were abbesses doing that? Because the ministry and office and order of deaconess was understood to have been transferred into the uh, ministry and order of abbess. And right down to our own times, abbesses, especially uh, in the Cistercian monasteries in Catalonia, but in other places too, they wore the stole, they read the gospel, they imparted a blessing. Um, now, Gilbert, or Gyula, 
He's getting ready for the Synod of Rath Brassel in Ireland, which will give the church in Ireland the shape it kind of almost has to this very day. And he writes a famous little book called uh, De Usu uh, Ecclesiae. And in it, he says, uh, the following can be ordained. And he lists the kinds of ministries for which there are ordinations. And one of them is abbess. So in 12th century Ireland, the man who laid the groundwork for the way in which the Irish church developed, organizationally speaking, believed that women could be ordained. And this wasn't just a throwaway comment on his part, because in the little booklet that he writes, which is uh, still available, it can, it can be found, he distinguishes himself from a famous theologian called Almarius of Mainz, can receive holy orders so it's 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 very it's very clear that he, he he thought about this and he believed that abbesses were ordained it was a real ordination and saint Eta. well her life is found in the codex kilkeniensis which is in marsh's library in dublin and there's a critical edition of it by an oxford man called Plummer about a century ago uh, in the Vita, Vitae Sanctorum Hibernicorum. And of course, one of the things that comes out in the life of, of Fledita on every page is that she was famous for hearing confessions and giving penances. Um, the manuscript is from the 15th century, so it's much later than her own life. But there are two things worth saying about the manuscript. One, Local legends, even though we don't have historical evidence in the sense of a, a, a contemporaneous text, local legends always have um, an undercurrent or a nugget of truth about them. But secondly, the document that says that St. Edith was famous for hearing confessions and giving absolution, even to murderers, Many of the confessions that, that are made to her are clearly by people who have come looking for absolution for murder. Uh, the fact that it was written in the 15th century at a time when a different theology was in the ascendancy meant that the memory, the local memory of this ministry of Eta in County Limerick was very strong. Now, I hope this is okay. I have no idea how, how, how you're hearing this or enjoying it, but um, I hope it's going okay. It's going superb, John. Really good. Keep going. Excellent. Thank okay. You. Now, when this famous document, uh, Inter in Signores, in the 1970s, set out to prove that the non ordination of women had always been the constant teaching of the church, it listed five authors from the patristic era who said no women's ordination plus three more texts from that time which said that this was the reason for this was fidelity to the ministry of christ now i'll go through these very very briefly they quote irenaeus but irenaeus is actually describing a gnostic religious service with overtones of magic they quote Tertullian, but Tertullian is actually speaking about heretical sects. They quote a guy called Vermilion of Caesarea, but he's actually talking about a demented woman, God bless her, who's suffering from uh, dissociated identity disorder, what would have been uh, traditionally spoken of as demonic possession. So obviously what these three patristic uh, fathers are talking about are women who are not truly ordained, not because they're women, because they're unwell. They quote Origen, but Origen mis misinterprets 1 Corinthians 14 in the manner that I have been explaining. He quotes St. Paul as saying it's shameful for a woman to speak in that particular piece in the middle of chapter 14 of the letter to the Corinthians. 
Paul's words, which as I've tried to explain, they are not. And then there's Epiphanius, and Epiphanius always tries to minimize the women. Uh, and he, he speaks about quote, the malady of the demented Eve. And that's so nakedly misogynist that you really can't take it seriously today. Three other texts are the Didascalia Apostolorum, um, where it says that women should baptize would be, for, would be to the great peril of the people. Well, obviously, women do baptize. And if we take the argument in the Didascalia seriously, if you argue from the fact that women can't be ordained because they can't baptize, well, maybe you could argue that they can be ordained from the fact that they can baptize. In the Apostolic Constitutions, um, there's also a gratuitous assumption about uh, the inferiority of women. And the text that that document is actually dealing with When that text comes to quoting the scholastics on the issue of non-ordainability of women in fidelity to the will of Christ, it quotes four scholastics. Bonaventure, Don Scotus, Durandus, and Richard of Middleton. When I first came across Richard of Middleton, I wondered if he was a Corkman. But actually, this is, uh, refers to Middleton in Lancashire. Now, all these four make the argument from tradition. Yes, they do. And then they go on to explain it by what the document itself calls a faulty argument, namely the supposition, the false supposition of the inferiority of women. Now, when you read the list of the scholastics that this document quotes, Bonaventure, Don Scotus, Richard of Middleton, Durandus, why does the document quote the greatest scholastic, the greatest theologian of all time in favor of the argument that the non-ordainability of women is the constant tradition of the church? comes to us from the teaching of Jesus himself, why do they not quote Thomas Aquinas? For the very simple reason that Thomas Aquinas never makes that argument. If there was such a, a tradition, surely he would have known about it. So far, so good, but now it gets worse. If we look at the reason that St. Thomas puts forward so Thomas Aquinas puts forward for the non-ordainability of women, it gets very gloomy indeed. And to, to put it in, in short, it's because he regards women in a state of being ruled and not in a state of ruling. It's a political argument. It's a socio-political construction. It's not at all a scriptural or liturgical construction. The phrase he uses is eminencia gradus, eminence of grade or status. And he holds that women do not possess this. And since the priest has to have eminencia gradus to be the leader, the priest. Now, the problem with this argument is that it is a political argument based on a contemporary understanding of the way the genders are ordered in a feudal society. When you take all those contextual issues out of the picture, the argument simply does not hold. And here is the main problem people who want to use St. Thomas, great theologian that he is, in this debate. The specific reason why, in his opinion, women cannot be ordained is because of what he regards as their political familiar inferiority. 
Now I want to turn to how these arguments are developed in more recent times. And in doing so, I want to keep two things in mind. The priest acting in the person of Christ, persona Christi, in the person of Christ, and the priest acting in persona ecclesia, in the person of the church. Now, after the medievals, the idea became cemented, fixed, that the priest acts in the person of Christ by repeating in the Holy Eucharist the actual words of institution, con consecration, as found in the New Testament. Talk to seven out of ten priests even today, and that's really what's in the hard disk. Big problem here. That way of thinking completely leaves out emphasis on the Holy Spirit. In the pre-Vatican II ordination rite of a priest, the bishop said, um, receive power to consecrate uh, the sacrifice. In the post-Vatican II ordination rite, the bishop says to the ordinant, receive from the holy people of God the gifts to be offered to God. Also at Vatican II, we see the three new Eucharistic prayers which have um, the epiclesis, that is to say the prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts that the people of God are offering through the prayers of the priest. We don't have an explicit epiclesis in the Roman canon. Just as, for example, in the uh, liturgical prayer, the, the Eucharistic prayer of the Eastern Assyrian Church, which has intercommunion with the Chaldean Catholic Church, there's no narrative of the Last Supper. The whole transformation of the species in the Holy Eucharist is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So to this way of thinking, just as the Holy Spirit hovers over the chaos at creation, just as the Holy Spirit hovers over Our Lady at the moment she conceives the Word of God in herself, so the Holy Spirit uh, hovers over the bread and wine. At that moment, the priest is the representative of the whole people of God. In the other way of looking at it, the priest is the personal representative representation of Christ. Now, these two things shouldn't be an element, a strong element of truth in both of them, but neither can one be eliminated. And here's the point. Every action of the church is the action of the risen Christ himself. The risen Christ, his actions, the one and eternal sacrifice, the personally saving act of the risen Christ, realized in an official liturgical act of his mystical body, the people of God, is an act of the church. It is the church as a whole. It is the people of God assembled in that Eucharistic service who are offering huh, the one and eternal sacrifice of Christ. The priest acts in the person of the church. It is the whole church, the whole community of the people of God who are offering the sacrifice, who, and the priest in their name, in, in the person of the church, calls down the Holy Spirit. So the fundamental priesthood is the priesthood of the people of God. The derived, even though really distinct in kind, ordained priesthood, uh, is the priesthood of the one who acts in the person of Christ, in the person of the church. He acts in the person of Christ in giving Holy Communion uh, to the assembly as, albeit in a derived way, do the Eucharistic ministers. So the fundamental priesthood is the priesthood of the Holy People of God who are not exclusively male. So then how do we deal with this question of natural resemblance 
uh, to Christ. The priest is considered to have a natural resemblance to Christ according to this rather narrow theology because he's male. But compare resemblance to Christ to Christ merely at the level of gender and compare resemblance to Christ at the level of faith, commitment, capacity. And which kind of resemblance to Christ are we looking for in our candidates for the presbyterate? We might also look at the letter to the Hebrews, which is the New Testament text, which deals uh, most uh, comprehensively with the priesthood of Christ. Son though he was, he learned obedience through the things he suffered and being perfected, uh, he became the source of eternal salvation to those who obey him, designated by God, a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. He becomes the high priest uh, through his willingness to suffer in fidelity to God and to the poor. His becoming a priest is existential, it's dynamic, it's developmental. So how can we resemble this priest? How can anyone have a natural resemblance to that priest? I think the only way is that as St. Paul puts it in Galatians 2.20, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now is the life of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me, which is a huge statement to make, but it's what we all aim however intermittently, at living and being and doing. So, in other words, it's people who take their baptism seriously, so seriously that they wish to live it out in that manner. These are the people who have a natural resemblance to Christ. Moreover, and this is very important, it is the risen, resurrected Christ who is priest forever. What is raised is in a spiritual body. The pan-cosmic resurrected Christ has transcended gender difference. As he says himself, it's recorded in Mark 12 and in Matthew 22, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And as St. Paul puts it in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation and the old has passed away. So resemblance to Christ is resemblance to the resurrected Christ, which is realized through living one's baptism in as full a way as one can. And all of that is as possible as indeed it is as difficult for a woman or for a man. How much time have I left, Patricia? Well, um, we've been going for about 40 minutes, I'd say now, or whatever. Okay. So if you... I probably I'll see. just make one final point. Okay. Brendan Kennelly has a quote saying, the singing girl is easy in her skill. You're a singing man, and it's very easy to listen to you, John. Okay. So um, if we finish soon, well, that's Bre fine. Brendan has, a way, Brendan has a way with words. <laughs> we have questions. Okay. In common catechesis, the bishops are the successors of the apostles. Okay. Are the apostles and the twelve exactly the same thing? Well, not really. In Mark's gospel, he appointed twelve. No mention of apostles. In Luke's gospel, he summoned his disciples. Apostle is actually a Greek word which is transposed back into the synoptic narratives. So the 12 are apostles, but the apostles include the 12 and include many more. Paul himself is the greatest of the apostles, but he was never uh, one of the 12. Paul also sees Timothy, Silvanus, and so many more as apostles. Could one of the apostles have been a woman? Well, in the letter to the Romans, chapter 16, verse uh, 7, St. Paul says, 
Greet Andronicus and Unia, outstanding, outstanding among the apostles who were in Christ before me. Now, Unia, who is Unia? Or if you like, Junia. Well, all the early church fathers considered Unia to be a woman. There is no Greek minuscule manuscript with the masculine form of Unia. And there are 20 Greek New Testament minuscule manuscripts with the feminine Unia. There are 16 Latin and Greek works from or around the first millennium that refer to Unia as a woman. Then along comes Giles of Rome, or Egidius as he's sometimes called, he lived in the second half of the 13th century, and he turns Andronicus and Unia into two men. And the bold Martin Luther comes along in the 16th century and does the same thing. And then in the English language, the revised version of the King James Bible has Unia as a man. And from that time, from the 1880s down to our own time, there are 20 English translations where Unia is a man and 10 where she's a woman. However, as in all, all modern uh, translations have her as a woman, as Bruce Metzger, the great New Testament scholar, said, the idea that Unia was a man is not based on the text. It's based on the contemporary prejudice that a woman couldn't be an apostle. Therefore, it was simply impossible. Therefore, the reading that she was a woman was wrong. But actually, textually, historically, exegetically, and in just about every other way, it's quite clear that Unia was a woman. And she was outstanding among the apostles and in Christ even before Paul himself. So Unia was an apostle. She was a woman. And the bishops are the successors of the apostles. So could a bishop be a woman? Well, I think so, yes. So thank you for your kind attention. Sorry if I've gone on a bit long. It's difficult talking at a blank screen, but I hope you got something out of all this. Thank you very much. John, thank you.